Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to give a talk about um, a series of workshops that was run um, in London um, over the last year about um, introducing <coughs> uh, NetBSD to a group of hardware enthusiasts. Um, in London, uh, we have a, a series of events that have been running for a few years uh, called the Open Source Hardware User Group. And um, at some point last year, I was asked um, on the theme of operating systems to come and represent um, the BSD family uh, to these hardware enthusiasts. And um, I thought about how I would kind of um, present this, because most people don't really care about software. Um, it's something that they have to kind of suffer to get their job done with their hardware. Um, and on this event, uh, we had a series of talks from myself doing the BSDs, a group of my friends representing the, um, uh, the Linux family, and then just to kind of keep it really out there, we had uh, Charles Forsyth uh, presenting the Plan 9 family op operating systems. Um, and the feedback was quite good. Um, and uh, moving along a few months, um, I got the opportunity to actually um, I run a series of workshops um, to uh, get people started. Um, so kind of thinking about how, how I would actually present the uh, BSDs uh, to them, I was, I'd, I've never done any kind of teaching before, so I thought that trying to actually run a workshop with like three or four different operating systems is quite a big take on. Um, so I thought I'd just stick with um, NetBSD uh, because I could think of um, some things that w I could demonstrate to them that would be beneficial. Um, and so I, I, I did that. And the, what I've kind of focused it around was basically around saving time. Uh, the reason was, uh, was uh, going back a few years, back in about 2013, uh, we actually did um, a series of workshops about um, introducing people to uh, FPGA, uh, FPGA programming. and. It was meant to be an event run over a weekend, and basically our first day was completely lost uh, to basically trying to get the Altera toolchain installed. <coughs> um, so what happens is with like the Altera toolchain is uh, if you have lots of money, they will sell you a very expensive IDE, and if you don't have it, you will get the same thing, but it's like the free edition. Now you'd think that if you don't have a license, you know, you could kind of um, operate it in the free mode, but that wasn't the case. And most people kind of, including myself, found this out where we kind of worked along with the uh, application. And then when we actually came to actually synthesize the, uh, our work, it goes, oh no, you don't have a license, you can't use this. And so you had to literally uninstall and go back and reinstall 12 gigabytes worth of um, application. Um, uh, ah. So from, from this experience uh, from the group actually uh, some uh, folks got together and um, uh, worked on a project to actually uh, make a new board so you're not a victim of uh, these kind of closed tools. Um, so the project that they've kind of put together is this um, MyStorm board, which is based on this um, Lattice um, FPGA chip, which is also open source. And um, yeah, you've got a, a nice, uh, very light tool chain, and you can do stuff with open hardware. Um, in other places in the world, you know, things are kind of still growing. Uh, you know, 60 gigabytes worth of toolchain uh, just to install uh, before you can kind of get started. Um, so why? Kind of to raise expectations. Like, uh, the, in this case, I'm presenting the NetBSDs. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do in the BSD family um, that, you know, kind of just avoids a whole bunch of problems that other people um, in other areas have to kind of suffer. Um, and just, yeah, demonstrates a, a little bit of respect for the user uh, that you can, uh, by using these, uh, this piece of software, you can save yourself a whole load of time and headache. Uh, but the thing is, is kind of, if you actually wanted to kind of get involved and um, develop, there's quite a steep le learning curve. So 
I really want to kind of keep it high level because yeah, we're not going to kind of get, in, get into actually trying to do something properly in the space of a, a, a short workshop. Um, but the thing is, as a culture, <laughs> no worries. Um, you know, resources are available. Like, um, I think we're approaching that uh, next month. We're approaching like uh, the 40th anniversary of like one BSD, and that's uh, you know, it's, it, all of that is available open um, to to track um, online. Uh, so you can see you can follow the ancestry and. Uh, see how the operating system has evolved. Um, there's uh, great texts, you know, like the Richard Stevens books, but that's not a light read. You know, the application programming in uh, advanced programming in a Unix environment is a fairly hefty, hefty book. And you know, learning C, yeah, you can learn uh, how to do like Hello World and stuff, but uh, can you actually handle uh, pointers and things like that in a safe manner? Uh, and can you actually demonstrate that and teach that in, a, in the space of a very short workshop? Unlikely. Um, design and implementation series, you know, I think uh, the first book came out about 20 years ago. So um, this is not a culture of, you know, describing your intention through comments or, you know, forcing people to read source code. Uh, there's actually decent text uh, to kind of supplement uh, the software development. Um, and aside from that, there's... Uh, uh, proper courses as well. So this is completely the opposite of what's there. It's kind of more of a gallery of how can we, uh, over the space of uh, like half a day, um, get to do some stuff uh, fairly quickly and um, fairly safely. Um, so what I was kind of thinking about was th these brittle tools and uh, painful experiences that people have to kind of go through. Um, have we? Have we all seen like Brendan Gregg shouting in the data center video? Uh, so, you know, it, it, that video is coming up to like kind of 10 years of uh, age and still like most people still don't have the ability to uh, instrument their systems in real time. Um, so I thought we should kind of really um, demonstrate something around that. Uh, there's a gentleman uh, by the name of Brett Victor who's a researcher. Um, and uh, he did a talk uh, called Inventing on Principle. And he kind of showed this environment that he'd kind of uh, built as a proof of concept uh, where uh, when you have a, a, re uh, a rich environment which allows you to kind of experiment with stuff um, very quickly and your feedback loops uh, almost instant, it becomes a case of it's not always a reactionary um, your workflow isn't always reactionary. You can actually start to project uh, where you want to go, and it becomes kind of much more intent-driven and forward-looking. Um, so I was kind of forward, uh, thinking about that as well and how I could uh, present that uh, to the attendees. Um, Brian Cantrell, I'm sure um, most, if not all of you, have heard of um, him. Uh, he did a talk back in uh, Lisa 2009 um, about... Um, D-Trace and how it came about. Um, before uh, D-Trace was a thing, um, Sun had a very big computer called the E10K. Um, and to actually go from a reboot to the system being functioning was about 45 minutes. And he was on a customer site trying to debug a problem, and the system kept on panicking. So every time it panics, it's like 45 minutes, and then you come back and you do something. And and that kind of becomes even worse when you're actually in operations and things like that, where your kind of feedback loop from you know, debugging the situation to um, actually implementing it in production can be quite a long time. And that's, you lose lots of context. Um, and yeah, on the theme of kind of brutal tools. <laughs> and so, you know. When you don't have any, your coping mechanism just ends up becoming like kind of abstracting your problems away, just kind of piling stuff on top of each other. Uh, or, you know, if, you, if, if you're dealing with like kind of closed systems and there's no way for you to kind of participate um, in the system or change it, you start manifesting these kind of really bad habits. You know, Windows users who, you know, trying to avoid at all costs rebooting because 
as soon as you reboot, that's like you know three reboot cycles of um, you know updates installing that you lose time on. Um, or you're dealing with a project that doesn't do project management properly, so you know you're in a rolling re release model, and you don't know if you uh, apply a patch or update to a new version, what's exactly going to change when you're actually just trying to uh, fix one bug. Um, and so that kind of ends up uh, manifesting it into like you know fear to explore ideas because the system is so clumsy and brittle that even the slightest change is going to come tumbling down on you. Um, or I'm sure most network engineers have this. Um, uh, you know, there's no room to maneuver. You, the only thing you have is the li live system um, because redundancy is a is a license feature. Uh, Uh, um, so, you know, some more uh, bad habits. Uh, well, we can avoid this whole problem by going serverless. Um, unikernels. Uh, do away with the ops team. <laughs> uh, Anti-kernel. Everything's in user space. Uh, so, uh, George Neville Neal, I think, uh, I think last week or maybe a week before. Uh, did this uh, quite nice article um, about uh, these kind of cultures about uh, avoiding uh, kernel programming and trying to push stuff into user space um, and some of the things that you may, uh, may not be aware of. Um, and PHK, a few years back, um, did a thing called The Generation Lost in a Bazaar, which was essentially a book, a, a book review of um, Frederick Brooks's... Uh, uh, the design of design, which kind of talks about uh, you know uh, co uh, institutional knowledge and kind of keeping a log and documenting your processes. Um, so, what are we going to explore? Um, constraint is you know, how do you how do you make this uh, present this operating system to someone who doesn't care about operating systems, um, and ignore the software features because it doesn't matter. They don't uh, they don't care about uh, the bells and whistles. So what did we explore? Uh, explore the documentation. You know, your first port of call isn't Google and someone's blog. Uh, we have our manuals online, um, and you can kind of drill down from there. Uh, if something isn't documented, that's a bug. Uh, this isn't actually specific to NetBSD, but um, that's what I kind of presented. Uh, the source repo, um, I think actually right at, at this moment there's a talk on the Unix architecture somewhere else um, about the Unix history uh, repo. Um, they're a privilege where we can kind of go back, I think, uh, 37 or 38 years. So we can actually see how the operating system is involved, um, which is maybe not a privilege for somebody in a fragmented um, operating system environment. Um, in cross compilation is really easy. There's no elaborate setup process. Um, so the idea is uh, a, an attendee would get a copy of the NetBSD source code, a copy of the package source, uh, source code, and we'd start building. Uh, we'd avoid uh, trying to do stuff safely in C by um, leaning on the uh, Lua environment that's in NetBSD. Um, how to do rapid rapid prototyping on the on your actual machine because it's going to be it's bound to be faster than the the Raspberry Pi or the ARM board that you're going to kind of work on uh, and sometimes you don't actually have the hardware to um, kind of um, you don't have the hardware that you're actually targeting so we have some uh, various simulation devices which allow you to kind of work away from that um, and so in the world of IoT, uh, security is an issue, and so I thought about kind of uh, demonstrating tamper resistance. Um, so should a binary change, the system won't execute it. Um, and we kind of uh, got away with it. Uh, <laughs> there was some, uh, the process was a little bit rough uh, in certain places. Um, so 
I had to kind of explore, explain to the people who turned up with like a, a Linux laptop that they have to install the UUCP uh, package in order to obtain uh, the CU command so they can connect to the serial adapter. Um, and then you have to change the permissions. Uh, uh, on RSX, it can be a lot worse because if they're, they're a bit confident, they'll start uh, Googling about how to kind of install their RSX drivers and they'll probably land on a blog post that says you should turn off kernel, sign, uh, kernel signing of uh, uh, drivers just to get some obscure driver that you've downloaded from a Chinese mirror. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so we still, uh, the main uh, t uh, tool chain in um, NetBSD is still uh, GCC. And if you're on a Mac and you're building with Clang, the nesting in um, GCC for C++ kind of blows up. So I had to kind of explain to the users about um, uh, adding extra flags to get the build done. Um, and ideally, we want to kind of do away with the serial header. But the reason I kind of went down the serial header route was I didn't want to actually have to walk through a, a classroom full of people on how to set up networking. And you know, ha they have to be in the same subnet. And this is how you connect. Um, so I kind of went down the serial header route. But then, obviously, I had these problems. Um, but one thing we've been thinking about is uh, for our ARM images, we have a uh, multicast DNS uh, set up. But we have this problem at the moment that there's no initial user. Um, so though you have a device that's connected on the network and broadcasting itself, you can't actually SSH in <coughs> um, and connect. Um, uh, so I kind of, try, in preparation for this, I was kind of uh, making sure that I covered all the angles. So I did a lot of uh, testing on Segwin and uh, Windows uh, for the cross-compilation side of things. And we kind of quickly got into um, autoconf hell, where some of the things that we had in base uh, just had no knowledge of like Windows 64-bit edition. So uh, it kind of fell short very quickly there. <coughs> Unbootable images. Um, I, for this. Uh, For the ARM boards, there's no um, unified way of uh, booting a system, depending on what you have. Um, you have something as drastic as you know, DDing a, a blob to the file system, to just uh, having a file on a, on a DOS partition that's marked active, uh, which is a thing from like the DOS era. But for some reason, it's kind of transferred into the, in the world of ARM for some reason. Um, and we actually had this with our BeagleBone uh, images, where uh, we were generating the images, but the FAT file system wasn't actually marked active, which means when you apply power to your ARM board, uh, U-boot will not actually look at the DOS partition uh, for the uh, bootloader and, and wouldn't boot. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't keep any notes, so I can't remember what that actually was. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so I, the, the two boards that I actually targeted was the uh, Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone Black. And it turned out that there were some inconsistencies between uh, what was there in the, in the co uh, configuration files for the kernel between the two boards, uh, which meant uh, some, uh, some attendees uh, couldn't do some of the steps, and the other ones um, were, uh, yeah. Uh, that was the thing. So I actually had to take a, a, a minor detour into getting people up to up to speed. Uh, and broken U-boot scripts. So um, we have a generic ARM image, and uh, the script uh, tries to enumerate what board you're actually booting on, and then load the relevant kernel uh, based on that, which means that we don't have to have um, loads of different images for different boards. Um, I think moving forward, this is, going to, uh, this is a non-problem because we end up actually relying on the flattened device tree. And uh, we just actually have one kernel, and we can do away with this. But uh, the way that we actually enumerated um, which board you were running on uh, was broken, which meant uh, on certain uh, BeagleBone blackboards, um, it wouldn't boot. Uh, 
so since doing those things, we made some changes to the, uh, to NetBSD. Uh, Mark Balmer uh, brought uh, the Lua uh, up to date uh, in our base. Um, uh, Jared McNeil uh, made the um, the U-boot packages, which means uh, it's literally adding three new variables in a make file if you want to support a new uh, new version of U-boot. Um, very exec, which was the tamper-resistant mechanism, uh, was supporting kind of things like uh, MD5 and SHA-1, uh, which are effectively broken. So we removed that, and the setup process is um, no longer required because it's working out of the box. Um, but there's still a lot more that we can do to just kind of make the process really smooth and really easy for kind of people to try uh, to try things out. Um, as always, there's more documentation needed. Um, um, more documentation needed to kind of explain the various subsystems. Um, uh, more Lua and Rump examples. Uh, so. Uh, what I wanted to do was basically uh, instruct people to show up with an ARM board and, uh, and a computer, and we can basically compile. Uh, you'll be given a copy of the source code. Uh, we can build an operating system, and you can boot it on your, on your ARM board and then kind of um, work through some exercises. Um, what I wanted to kind of avoid is actually having to request that they show up with a breadboard and... Um, you know, various uh, c components or for me to have to supply a breadboard and various pr peripherals to try. Uh, so I looked into um, what I could do actually on the board. Um, and I think for like the GPIO exercises, um, the, uh, B not the, B the Raspberry Pi uh, l lets you control one of the LEDs, which is the, uh, for the Ethernet. So you can kind of switch that on and off. Um, uh, and not much else. Um, so I want to kind of do something a bit more elaborate that, uh, than just uh, trying to uh, switch an LED on and off. Uh, w yeah, so we've been kind of discussing uh, how to actually add users to an image um, so that um, the user just basically downloads uh, an image for the operating system or takes the image for the operating system, puts it onto an SD card, uh, maybe adds an entry for a username um, and a password, and they can boot uh, the system. Uh, we don't have to faff around with uh, serial console drivers and uh, things like that. Um, Mark has this uh, Lua Unix uh, binding, which is... Um, uh, gives you uh, various system calls and uh, functions um, in Lua, so we can do a bit more systems-related things uh, from our Lua environment. Um, and maybe kind of look at the uh, testing um, framework that we have, so we can further uh, move away from doing things on the actual board into uh, doing testing locally. Um, so spinning up a, an instance of Kemu, uh, running through some tests, and then shutting the system down you know, if, the, if the system worked OK. Uh, some people uh, that I'd like to thank, uh, Andrew Back, who uh, invited me to uh, do the talks in the workshops, the Open Source Hardware User Group, the London Hackspace, um, some NetBSD developers who helped along the way. Um, do we have any questions? All right, thank you.